Hello, and welcome to Capital Compass. We are the official podcast of the New York State Catholic Conference. I'm your host, Jillian. Today, in episode 27, I'll be talking with Joe Zala, ethicist for the National Catholic Bioethics Center, about the dangers of the abortion pills. At the beginning of this year, the FDA finalized a rule change that expands availability of the abortion pills Mifepristone and Misoprostol to more pharmacies, including large chains and mail-order companies. In response to this, states across the country have been taking different approaches. On the pro-life side, we are seeing a high number of government officials pushing back. This includes 22 attorneys generals suing the FDA, arguing the FDA action is illegal and that making them available through the mail contravenes the law in their states regulating abortion. However, unfortunately, in New York, the legislature continues to present abortion as the only solution to crisis pregnancy. Here to talk about the dangers of the abortion pill is Joe Zalot, a staff ethicist for the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Joe has a Ph.D. from Marquette University, an M.E.D. from Boston College, an M.E.D. from Springfield College, and a B.A. from St. Anselm College. His many accomplishments include teaching at the Antheneum of Ohio, Mount St. Mary's Seminary, and Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati, authoring two books, lecturing for NCBC, and responding to ethics consultations. So, welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks, Julian. Great to be here. Uh, So, I guess to start off, can you let our listeners know what exactly a staff ethicist is before we really dive into the abortion pills? Well, I, I like to describe my job as being, I, I, I get to participate in really all of the different aspects of the NCBC. So our main, um, our main programs are, are, we have an education program, uh, we have a publications, and we do consultations. And I get to participate in, in all three of those um, and, you know, and do a whole bunch of different things. Um, one of them being our podcast. So I, I host the NCBC's podcast. So it's, it's always interesting to be on the other side of the microphone. All right. So you are here to talk about the abortion pills. So can you start by explaining the difference between a chemical, also known as a medical abortion, um, versus a surgical abortion? Yeah, sure. So let's let's kind of talk. Let's start with the second one. So a surgical abortion is as it's described. It's a surgical procedure that ends a human life. So um, just a plug to live action, they, on their website, they have some really wonderful, they're animated videos, they're not real abortion videos, but they're animated videos that show people exactly what the different surgical abortion procedures are. So for example, there's, for early term abortion, there's vacuum aspiration, which is essentially a kind of an industrial strength vacuum cleaner that sucks the, the newly formed human being out of the mother's uterus. Dilation and evacuation, another one, sort of a, a mid-pregnancy surgical procedure where doctors go in and, you know, and cut the, essentially cut the child in pieces and remove those, move the pieces. So a surgical abortion is simply that. It's a surgical procedure in, that intends to end the life of an unborn child. A chemical or a medical abortion procedure is a, it's, it's a pill, right? It's a, uh, it's a two-pill regimen. So if a woman is wants to terminate her pregnancy using uh, the chemical abortion method, she'll the first pill she'll take is a pill called mifepristone, and mifepristone, to be very brief, um, essentially blocks uh, the progesterone in her body. The child is deprived of of necessary nutrients, and the child dies. After I think it's seventy two hours after you take the mifepristone, the woman then takes another drug called misoprostol, which initiates uterine contractions, and her now dead child is expelled uh, from her body. And oftentimes that happens at home without any medical supervision. It's important. I, I asked a, a physician one time, and, and Jillian, I don't know if you've seen or your listeners have seen the movie Unplanned by Abby, uh, the, the Abby Johnson story, and they depict a chemical abortion in the movie. And I think that's, that's what got the movie an R rating. And I asked doctors, I said, is that, you know, is the depiction that they offered realistic? And they said, yes. So, um, you know, we have uh, at least kind of examples. What One other just last thing about the difference between the two, if I could, there's a really important distinction to keep in mind between surgical abortion and chemical abortion. So in a surgical abortion, the doctor is the abortionist. With chemical abortion, the mother is the abortionist. 
And that is a, you know, that obviously that's a huge difference and that plays into the psychological factors that maybe we'll talk about a little bit later on. Of course. So also talking about differences, I want to make sure there's no confusion to our listeners. Obviously, there is a difference between the morning after pill and the abortion pills. Yes. Can you kind of explain that just because, you know, you, you just think of medications and I want to make sure everybody knows the difference. Yeah, we get that in our consultation line too. There's a lot of confusion out there between what the more the quote unquote morning after pill is and and what uh, chemical abortion is. So morning after pill, generally speaking, we're talking about Plan B, which is a um, it's a it's a very high dose of the uh, the hormone uh, levonorgestrel. And basically, what the morning after pill or Plan B is, and, and actually the FDA has done some very interesting things with Plan B recently as well too. But um, Plan B is, is, is essentially the emergency contraceptive pill. So if a woman has uh, quote unquote unprotected sex or is a victim of sexual assault, Plan B is given to her. And the FDA has just changed things on it. But historically, Plan B worked to prevent ovulation. And also it could have the effect of if um, fertilization did happen, it would uh, seek to prevent the newly formed embryo, the newly formed human being from implanting in the, in the mother's uterus. Now, the this FDA just before Christmas of 2022 came out with some new clarifications. We're not really, um, we have some questions about that. In fact, we have a couple of podcasts on that available. But that's, uh, that's what the morning after pill, it's emergency contraception. Whereas mifepristone, as we've been talking about before, that, that occurs, that's taken after implantation, right? So the child is developing in the mother's uterus, and that pill is taken to uh, end the life of that child in utero. All right. Now to dive in more on the abortion pills, the pro-choice side will say that the abortion pills are safer and easier. So is that true? And, um, what, you know, what are the side effects for it? Yeah, I uh, we hear that all the time, that abortion supporters will say that chemical abortion is safe and effective and this and that and everything else. Well, we would tend to disagree with that. And, and if I could just give a plug, because I'm going to get this information from a, a podcast that we did back in 2021 with the Charlotte Lozier Institute. It's, our, it's one of our bioethics on air episodes. It's number 75. It's called Straight Talk on Chemical Abortion. And I asked the people at Charlotte Lozier, because these are the scientific people. These are the ones who actually study this stuff. And basically, the response that came back was, well, the, the information that we have is that the complication rates with chemical abortion are four times higher than they are for surgical abortion. And even those numbers are kind of disputed because, well, I don't want to say disputed, but are kind of fuzzy because there's very serious concerns that the, the side effects are underreported because apparently as of 2016, the FDA only requires reporting if a woman dies as a result of mifepristone, not any of the other complications. So it's probably, uh, it's probably quite a bit higher. But what are some of the, the complications? Well, uh, certainly excessive bleeding. And again, if the if you ever people see the uh, the unplanned uh, movie, that is definitely depicted in there. And in fact, excessive bleeding to the point where women need blood transfusions. That's a really important thing. Um, ectopic pregnancy rupture. Um, when we get to the question of telemedicine, this may uh, this will, will come up even even more importantly. But if a woman has an ectopic pregnancy and she takes uh, she, she's not treating the ectopic pregnancy, she's just taking the uh, the abortion pill, her fallopian tube can rupture. And she can she can bleed out. There's also evidence to suggest that mifepristone suppresses a woman's immune system, so that she's more susceptible to infection. And also, uh, she's also susceptible to infection because, in not all cases, and particularly as you get later on in gestation, the abortion pill does not. Exp I'm trying to be delicate here, but you really can't be. Doesn't expel all of um, the tissue, the the unborn child's tissue, and some of that remains in her. And it's a source of infection as well. So there are, and those are just the physical effects. We're not even talking the psychological effects of that. You know, there are there are very real complications. As the latest I heard, 28 women have died that we know of directly from using mifepristone. There have been at least 500 life-threatening complications and almost 2,000 severe complications reported. And again, these numbers are believed to be conservative because the FDA has lowered the bar for doctors reporting these complications, but they are there. So don't let the abortion supporters tell you that it's safe because evidence demonstrates it's not. I also do want to note that um, through my research, I noticed that the FDA had only approved 
the drug in the United States um, in 2000. So you're looking at these right. statistics that are very conservative, and they're only within the last 22 years. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then also um, another thing is that they say bleeding is normal, but obviously bleeding to the extent that you need a transfusion is not. Is not. <laughs> I, I'm not a medical doctor, but I would say that you are probably correct on that. Yes. Yeah, but that's I, that's one of the I think we'll talk about this more later in this episode. But one of the dangers is not exactly possibly knowing what is a quote unquote regular side effect and what is obviously life threatening. Yeah, and that's actually a really important point because when women are given this uh, th this two drug regimen, they are told when they take the misoprostol that the drug that's going to initiate uterine contractions, well, you know, that's going to hurt. You're going to feel pain. There's going to be, um, like uh, in one's menstrual cycle, there's going to be blood. Right? That, those things are going to happen. And the question for the woman who's taking this, and again, she's taking this at home. All right, this is all happening at home. There's no medical supervision of all, when all of this is happening. And how does she know when the the complications or or when the when the effects um, are you know are they quote unquote normal for this for this process, or has she gone to is she beyond that and is is her health and her life actually in danger? And and you know you don't know. And before we talk about the um, current New York State. Uh, legislation being proposed. I do want to ask you if a woman has a change of heart after taking the first pill, which is the one that lowers your progesterone, um, does she have any recourse? Yes, I'm actually, thanks, Julie. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to make sure we, we, we talked about that, um, that if you didn't. Yes, there is something called abortion pill reversal. Um, and in fact, the, the, the website, abortionpillreversal.com, uh, there's a 24 hour helpline, it's 1 877. 558-0333. And what women can do is, and this has happened, I, I mean, I, I believe, I don't know what the numbers are, but there are into the thousands now of children who have been saved. A woman takes the first pill. She takes the, um, she takes the misopristone, mifepristone, sorry, and she regrets her decision, right? What she can do is contact this uh, abortion pill reversal network. She will be connected to a, uh, a doctor, in her area and the doctor will see her or possibly even telemedicine immediately and she can get a prescription for uh, progesterone, right? And what doctors have found, uh, this is Dr. George Delgado was the first one who, who kind of discovered this out in California. He, um, he found that if um, women are given high doses of progesterone, those pregnancies can be saved and those children have been born. And we there is there is ample evidence of it. So just because a woman may take um, the the uh, mifepristone, uh, as long as she hasn't taken the misoprostol, uh, there's a there's a chance that she could save you know could save the life of her child. It's it's most important to, to do it as soon as possible. Um, but yes, there is there there is a way to reverse the effects of chemical abortion. Now, kind of back to unfortunately these chemical abortions in New York State. In her State of the State address, Governor Hochul mentioned wanting to ensure abortion access at public colleges and universities, um, which would be the SUNY and CUNY systems. Given the known dangers of chemical abortions, do you think this is a good idea? I mean, you know, we're talking about, we're, generally we're talking about college-age students, so that could be anywhere from, what, 17 to 22, 23? Sure. Well, it's, it's obviously not a good idea. It's not a good idea for anybody. Um, but I think particularly when you're talking about colleges and universities, it, it, you know, things are, are, are ramped up some. And I know California has done um, the same thing. And I suppose if it comes out of California, boy, it, it must be the right thing to do, as I, I say, as I'm rolling my eyes. Yeah, I mean, in addition to the, the complications, um, the regret, the psychological issues and everything else, what this is doing is, as kind of the whole sexual revolution has done, what it's doing is it's actually incentivizing um, poor behavior on campuses. I mean, it's it's you're giving women. Well, first of all, you're, you're putting you're certainly putting the onus for quote unquote preventing pregnancy and you know the hookup culture and everything else solely on the women, 
I mean, what the sexual revolution has done is, is essentially it's, it's kind of absolved men, so to speak, from responsibility for their sexual actions. And this is just kind of the, the last backup, so to speak, in that process. So you, you're incentivizing sexual behavior, essentially, and you know, you're making these things available to women um, who, you know, as you said, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, who, you know, there's real questions about informed consent across the board, but, you know, a 17, 18 year old high school freshman, or excuse me, college freshman, who, or maybe even high school freshman at this point, um, who, you know, finds herself pregnant. She's, she's scared. She's embarrassed. She hears about these, these drugs and she, she runs to get them because they're quote unquote, you know, they're free, quote unquote, to, to get. And she really has no idea about what the effects of this are and how this is going to impact her down the road. So it's, it's really, it, it's just, it, it, it's incredibly irresponsible. Um, and, you know, for, for uh, government officials to push this, um, I, I just shake my head. So also speaking in current affairs in New York State, so obviously we know since COVID-19, there have been a rise in telehealth appointments. Um, some, pri pr excuse me, some providers even allow you to access the abortion pills through these meetings. You know, um, New York State is talking about they want to shield uh, healthcare practitioners from legal action in other states for prescribing the abortion medication via telehealth, like in New York State. So, for example, a doctor in New York State could meet with somebody in a different state, uh, most likely with um, stricter abortion laws, um, and prescribe them abortion medication. You know, um, how dangerous can this be? You know, you're not seeing a, you're not physically seeing a doctor here. Uh, well, in short, very dangerous. So, <laughs> so there's there's a couple things going on um, in your question, and we'll kind of come back to the the proposed law in New York um, in a bit. But I, I think it's really important to point out that abortion supporters want telemedicine for the purpose of expanding abortion, and particularly through abortion pills. That's what they want. All right, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, they will. I mean, in fact, I think the the latest um, the latest figures we have is is between fifty five and fifty. I think it's between fifty five and sixty percent of all abortions that happen in the country today are chemical abortions. So there's less and less surgical abortion. There's more and more um, chemical abortions, and telehealth is the means to do this. So it'll be you know telehealth will be um, marketed to women in rural areas, or you don't need to go to a clinic. You know, it's cheaper, um, this, that, and everything else. But really what it comes down to is that the, the abortion industry is seeing telemedicine as a means to bypass laws and states that have banned or restricted abortion or have banned or restricted chemical abortion, All right? This is the way to get around it. We don't, you know, we, you know, this is their aim. They've said this. Um, the, you sent me a couple of articles, and that's that's basically what they're saying is to, you know, in so-called red states, which they denigrate, um, we're just going to go in there and we're going to protect doctors, you know, from any kind of legal liability. I think it's really important. This, and I think that, I, I think a really important thing to say about telemedicine, and I, I think your your listeners need to know this, is that the FD, uh, excuse me, the abortion supporters have used telemedicine to force the Food and Drug Administration to essentially get rid of its, its REMS um, program with, with um, chemical abortion. So REMS stands for Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy, uh, R-E-M-S, Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy. And basically what that means is that if you have a really dangerous drug, let's just use drugs in this case, the Food and Drug Administration requires that you have certain protocols that have to be put in place to make sure that the drug is administered safely, right? And up until very recently, um, mifepristone was on the REMS. Particularly what the, what the REMS stated was that you had to have an in-person meeting in order to get the drug. And the reasons for that was, you know, the doctor had to certify um, that you were 70 days um, you have 10 weeks gestational limit, because after that, there's grave complications, uh, that you don't have an ectopic pregnancy. I mentioned that earlier. 
right? If you if you if you have a, a if you're pregnant, you take a pregnancy test, you could have an ectopic pregnancy, and mifepristone is going to do nothing for that, and it's very very dangerous. Now, the abortion industry used COVID-19 to sue, and they've been trying to do this for years, but they used COVID-19 to get the FDA to drop the REMS requirement for mifepristone, and essentially to say, we're, we're going to undercut the safety um, aspects that are in place. And they were successful in doing that. The FDA announced in um, December of 2021 that, you know, okay, you can do this, um, you know, the, the pills can be available wherever. And just recently, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the podcast, they have just completely dropped um, the in-person requirement. And now these pills can be dispensed through retail pharmacies and CVS and Walgreens have said that they are going to do this. This is really, really dangerous. Um, and the abortion industry is, uh, they are really putting um, women at risk. And just one final thing on this, a friend of mine, Tom Shakely from Americans United for Life, we had him on a podcast a little while ago, and he said, you know, what telemedicine does, and I mentioned this earlier uh, a bit, what telemedicine does is it actually gets the abortion industry off the hook for complications. So you go into a surgical center and a surgical abortion is performed. If there's complications, well, the center is responsible, right? And there's records of that. Planned Parenthood or whomever give women abortion pills. They go home. They have complications. There's no, it, it doesn't get back to Planned Parenthood, right? Or whoever is providing these drugs. So it's, again, telemedicine here is being used to expand abortion. It's being used to shield abortion providers against um, litigation. And it's, it's really dangerous for women. And apparently the abortion industry just doesn't care because they say it's safe. Now I want to mention, obviously, we've talked about ectopic pregnancies, and that's important to see a doctor physically instead of getting abortion medication via telehealth. But what about, are, you know, there is a certain time frame within um, your pregnancy that you are supposed to take the medication. And if you do it after that, there are severe risks for that too, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, now the FDA may have changed this. So I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm open to correction on this, but I believe mifepristone is indicated, as I said, up to 70 days or 10 weeks pregnancy. It's given beyond that. And in fact, internet, the international abortion supporters are actually doing their testing in Africa you know, out of out of sight, out of mind, um, up to I think twenty two weeks, right? Uh, the the um, I was just reading in preparing for this interview. I was reading a uh, an interview by um, a physician, Donna Harrison, who is the I think she's either I think she's the former president of the American Association of Pro Life OBGYNs, and she was saying that you know if a woman takes mifepristone at seven weeks, there's about a five percent chance that um, she needs to have a follow-up surgical procedure. However, if you take it at, I believe, 13 weeks, that number goes up to 33%. So yeah, so the, the, uh, it, it's really important uh, for the abortion industry. It's really important that this be done earlier. But the fact of the matter is it, it, it seems that, well, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to them. Um, you know, all, but, the, but the evidence is there that the later you take the... Um, the mifepristone, the, the chemical abortion in one's pregnancy, the greater the complications. Now, one of the things we also focus on is trying to care for every human, obviously, um, as Catholics. But also, we have to look at the other side of this in terms of the implications that could mean the abortion with easier access to the abortion pills. What about women who are being trafficked or abused? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a this is a, a golden goose um, for those who are um, in the sex trafficking business. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you are trafficked, particularly if you're tracking, well, you're trafficking women, which is most of it. Um, this is this is what they you know, this this is what that industry wants. It's an easy way to um, to access abortion for women. You don't have to, you know, the traffickers don't have to bring them to abortion centers to get the abortions where there's a possibility that they could be, you know, that they could be identified, although there's very real questions of whether the abortion industry does that either. But it's very anonymous. 
um, a woman is, you know, especially if it's done through telemedicine, um, you know, the sex trafficker is sitting just off camera and the woman comes on and, you know, she says she's pregnant and, and she wants to access the abortion pills. Apparently there's a, a mechanism as well where, where people can get access to these abortion pills in bulk. And it's like, you know, again, it's a sex trafficker's dream. But the other, another thing to keep in mind with this is that in, in addition to that, there's also, um, it, it could be used by abusive partners. So there are documented cases where, um, whether it's a boyfriend or even a husband, you know, a woman becomes pregnant and she, she wants to, you know, she wants to raise a child. He doesn't. He accesses the mifepristone and grinds it up, puts it in her food, puts it in her drink. She takes it, she, you know, she, she loses the pregnancy and the woman doesn't even know, right? And this has happened and there are documented cases where this has happened. So it just, you know, the, 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 the possibility for abuse is, is very high as well too. And, and for those who don't want women to be pregnant, there, there's, this is more of an incentive and it's an easier thing to do. But one of the things I want to highlight is the easiest thing is not the necessarily the right thing. I mean, here in New York, we're looking at the legislature. They continue to present abortion as the only solution to crisis pregnancy. And obviously, there are other alternatives. Um, I want to get more into that. But before I do that, I just want to cover this um, quickly of the fact that abortion can be both physically and emotionally traumatic. Um, I've heard of a lot of women who never forget about that abortion that they had and the child that, you know, would be X years old now. Um, so although abortions have de decreased over the last decade, according to the CDC, pro-choice uh, pro organizations are pushing even more access to abortion. Some clinics provide medical abortions to aim to normalize, quote unquote, normalize the process. I saw one article that was talking about, um, one place offering a quote unquote spa like experience, you know, why is it important to not normalize this process? You know, shouldn't we be discussing the mental health implications that come along with a woman deciding to end her baby's life? It's more than just a split second decision. You know, as we talked about earlier, there is a, an abortion reversal pill and that's because a lot of women end up regretting taking the first pill. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, 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 well, if the question is why does the abortion industry not focus on these things, I think the answer is very obvious. I mean, it goes against their narrative. Um, also, another thing to keep in mind is, and we keep saying the abortion industry, and it is an industry. And keep that in mind. This is a this is a huge money making project, right? They don't want to end the money train because that's what it's all about. It's all about money. It's really not about women's health, as they would say. I mean, look at the states that have, you know, that have. Uh, banned or put severe restrictions on abortion, what does Planned Parenthood and others do? They've, they've hightailed it and run. And it's like, well, I thought this was only 3% of your business. Why are you leaving? You know, it, it, you know that whole thing. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, um, there, are, there are certainly alternatives to abortion. There are, there are pro I, I, The last number I heard, it's either three times or five times more pro-life pregnancy centers in the United States than there are abortion centers. Um, so there's lots of uh, support out there. Uh, and, you know, we need to be, you know, we need to be focusing there. Yeah. And one of another, another thing I want to highlight, um, which we talked about earlier when we were talking about the SUNY and CUNY campuses, is that um, with the quote unquote normalization of abortion, in a way, I feel like it, you know, encourages people not to practice safe sex. You know, for instance, unfortunately for some people. Or uh, not engage in sex. Maybe that's an even bigger thing. Yeah. Just yeah. Not engage in it. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, unfortunately for some people, you know, abortion is their plan A, which obviously I, I feel like um, we need to talk about more educating people on sex ed and, you know, obviously preferably abstinence, but you obviously there will people who will be sexually active and we need to focus more on other things you can do rather than just abortions. And as you said, it is an industry. Yeah. And I think something along the lines with that is that the abortion industry and the political left has been very successful in our country in convincing people that nascent human life is not human life. Um, 
you know, the, the lies of the abortion. I, I stand outside and I pray outside two abortion centers here in Philadelphia. And women will say, it's not a baby. It's not a blah, blah. And it's just, they're, they're just blatantly wrong. I mean, scientifically, they're wrong. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the big, that's one of the big issues is that, you know, children in schools, their textbooks are telling them that, you know, this is not a human life until whenever, you know, and there, there's no, no real answer when, whenever is, but, um, you know, and it, it just it ignores the very clear scientific evidence that demonstrates that human life, uh, objectively speaking, begins when, uh, begins at fertilization, conception, or sperm egg fusion, whichever term you want to use. I mean, it's very, very clear. Um, and I think that's, as far as an educational um, point, I think that that's a very, that, that's really central for this whole debate moving forward is when does human life begin? That really is the bottom line question. And the abortion industry has distorted that for years. And they have that in the psyche. They've got, you know, they've got the universities, they've got the public education systems, they've got the media, they've got Hollywood, they've got everybody believing the baloney that they, um, that they, that they believe. And it's just absolutely not true. Um, this actually reminds me, I want to give our listeners a heads up that the legislature, the New York State Legislature is also trying to um, progress a bill that would define a human embryo as a quote unquote tissue. Um, just so people yeah. know, I will be leaving the bill numbers in our show notes. And um, please contact your legislators and tell them that this is not okay. Yeah. And it's not true. Yeah. That, that's the Absolutely. point. It's, it's simply not true. Um, and lastly, I just want to, you know, as I mentioned, seeking alternatives. Both the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Bishops of New York have created initiatives to help mothers and children, um, mm -hmm. both before and after birth, as a positive alternative to abortion. Um, so as Catholics, how can we encourage more people to seek alternatives rather than abortions? Well, I, I think there's a number of ways you could do it. I, I think uh, people can become involved. Um, the uh, Walking with Moms in Need program is, is really, it's a parish-based program to really get the get the word out, you know, to understand what's going on, understand the the resources that are available, so that when someone, you know, when a loved one or when a family member is is facing an unexpected pregnancy, one can say, you know, there's resources available here, here, here. Let, how can I help you? You know, what you know, what can I do to, you know, to help you um, in in this journey? I, I think also to just being an being an educator, um, I, I think it's really important for people to actually understand the realities of of what we're talking about. And so, just a couple of, of shout outs. I mentioned the Charlotte Lozier Institute. They just put out a a brand new. Uh, it's a really wonderful um, online resource. It's called The Voyage of Life, and it explains very clearly with with videos and animations and everything else. Just when does human life begin? And and you know and and starting there and, and, and trying to counter this narrative that, you know, it's just, it's just you know, this, a human embryo is just tissue. I mean, that, that's utter nonsense. Um, and, and I think this stuff gets by because people simply are not educated. You know, they're educated by the culture. They're educated by the abortion industry. They're educated about biology by the abortion industry. And that's a real problem. And so I, I think, you know, I think education is a key, but also knowing where those resources are um, so that one can help people in these situations. And finally, probably most importantly, pray, pray, pray. Um, pray for those mothers who are facing these challenges. Pray for politicians, particularly Catholic politicians. Um, and I will say it, Joe Biden, uh, Nancy Pelosi, um, all those who claim to be Catholic, who... Um, undercut life. Um, they need to be prayed for uh, in a very big way. Thank you so much for just scratching the surface on this. <laughs> and that's all we did. I know. Yeah, that's all we've done today. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. To learn more about the legislation being discussed in Albany, please check our show notes on the abortion pills. Thanks for listening to the Capital Compass podcast. And thank you so much to Joe Zaylot for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll be coming out with a new episode every other week. If you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. 
Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And to catch all the latest from the conference, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at NYS Catholic Conf and on Facebook at NYS Catholic Conference. Thanks again and God bless.